Greetings and um, welcome to everybody. Everybody who's tuned in today for this, this session. I'm very grateful grateful for um, asking Will and Daniel Threlfall from Steam Attic to join us today. Today, um, this is the first time that with these Crawford Lunch and Learn sessions that we've gone outside of Crawford itself. So it's something of an experiment, and um, if it doesn't work, I hope you'll uh, hope you'll accept my apolog apologies. Um, as always with sort of technology stuff, it's a sort of an exper experiment and I'd welcome any feedback on work, what works and what doesn't work. By way of background, um, I think those of us who, who operate in the, so particularly in the large and complex claims area, have often worked with Steamatic and especially with Daniel and William, William on complex claims. And the one of the great benefits of working with Steamatic, and I, I should make the point that Steamatic are um, partners of Crawford's Contractor Connections business under Tim Butler. Uh, but working with Steamatic, I've often found that they're able to offer innovative solution, solutions to major and complex claims. In particular, Daniel did a extremely complex, high, high intensity clean uh, for a dairy, complete dairy factory, factory with me going back about 10 years ago, years ago which was a remarkably successful, successful although very complex exercise requiring four stages of cleaning. Um, the vision is sort of the strategic vision that Daniel and William would bring, bring to sort of management of, of complex claims. I also asked them to think about the implications both at a practical level of the sort of COVID-19 cleaning, cleaning um, which we're having to deal with on a recurrent basis. I was just looking at a, an email a few minutes ago from someone mentioning that they needed their premises cleaned for COVID-19 clean. So that's quite a deep clean sort of exercise. And more strategically, the sort of implications implications for insurers at looking at cleaning, looking at the costs of cleaning and looking at the sort of the overall impact. So the claim, uh, th this session essentially falls into two major things, a practical sort of thing about the, the practical implications of cleaning that um, Steamatic have seen over the last 12 months or so, and more generally a, a sort of a discussion about sort of the implications for uh, the insurance industry and understanding costs and understanding strategy. strategy. So I'll actually throw over to Will Threlfall to do the first half of the session. So uh, uh, welcome to Will and to Daniel. So thanks very much. Thanks, Graham. I appreciate the introduction and um, and also the opportunity that yourself and Crawford's given us to present today. Um, as you touched on, we're going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 cleaning. Uh, one, the approach that's taken uh, when you when you're encountering these sorts of uh, these sorts of challenges, um, but also the issues that have come with that over the course of the last 18 months. It is now, and uh, sort of the the changes that we've seen in the industry uh, with different government and uh, you know both state and federal announcements with restrictions and the like. Uh, but also the, the progression with the, the training and the approach taken on uh, COVID-19 cleaning, uh, but then also the impact just from a day-to-day -day operation that we've seen in the restoration and insurance space, sort of a bit separate to COVID-19, but the impact that the pandemic has had on us. So Dan, I'll, I'll ask you to, you're controlling the slides, I'll ask you to jump over to the first slide, talk a little bit about the uh, the different types of COVID-19 uh, cleaning and, and really there's there's predominantly the two. There's the, the routine cleaning. Um, this is something that many businesses, uh, have you still got me that you can still hear me guys? Yep, yeah. sorry. Uh, this is something that, uh, yeah, many businesses have had to consider now, uh, so as well as facilities and uh, public spaces. The routine cleaning, uh, you've got to consider the frequency that this needs to be conducted, obviously as a, uh, uh, I guess a mitigation sort of step in, in reducing the risk of COVID-19 spread. So you've got to think about uh, the cleaning of frequently touched surfaces. Obviously the transmission of COVID-19 is uh, predominantly through droplets, uh, generally inhaled or uh, consumed or through a, 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 um, a membrane, uh, but obviously can be done through touch and then the rubbing of the face. So you've got to consider things like Door handles, door frames, uh, kitchen and bathroom tapware, uh, office workstations, particularly in office spaces where hot, desking, hot desk, desk topping may have been a thing. Um, then you sort of move on to the, the deep cleaning, which as Graham touched on, 
has become a thing now uh, when there's been either a confirmed exposure at a particular site, but also we take the same approach um, when there's been a suspected case. Uh, obviously, we have to treat it with uh, particular caution um, and ensure that the right uh, processes are, are followed. So generally, the, with a deep clean, uh, the process is, is a two-step process, and I'll talk a little bit more in, on one of my next slides on that. But the, the main thing that you've got to consider with the COVID deep cleaning is that you're actually doing a clean first using a detergent. Uh, this is to remove sort of the grimes and general dirt, debris and soiling that's left on surfaces, because you'll find that the virus actually adheres to these as well as the surface. So you can't actually just walk in and complete a disinfection spray or fogging. Again, I'll touch on this a little bit later, uh, but it's certainly something that we've seen a little bit in the media. Dan, I might ask you to jump onto the next slide for me. So I'll talk about the, the cleaning principles and I guess the, the number of different items you've got to consider when conducting a, a COVID-19 clean. Um, first of all is competently trained staff or contractors that are performing it. So there's uh, certainly early on, uh, there was limited training, particularly for a COVID-19 response. Um, so what was first adopted was an approach that was a combination of similar principles to uh, trauma cleaning and also uh, clandestine drug lab cleaning. Um, this had to consider PPE requirements. Obviously, uh, the transmission, transmission methods we spoke about just before needed to be considered. So face shields, masks, as you've seen in healthcare, have become quite common. Um, obviously, gloves and then Tyvex as well. We have to consider a, a pretty tight donning and doffing regime when going in and out of these places as well. So the uh, staff working on sites have to walk uh, through a, basically a containment chamber where they remove uh, PPE and bag up so that that isn't transmitted then to another site. Um, this is then always treated as medical waste as well. Um, while we're doing that, uh, uh, we didn't have to, or when we're first contacted after an exposure site or suspected site, we have to consider a site risk assessment. Um, the risk assessment identifies the areas that the case has been present in a property. And this is something that uh, came a little bit more uh, predominant the further we got into the COVID pandemic, um, where a practical approach was taken in identifying the, the exposure of a particular site. Um, I'll talk about it in a couple of case studies a little bit later on. But what we use there is a combination of um, either the business or an employee's um, uh, recollection of their movements through that space um, and looking at the role and the duties that they perform and where they may have been. Uh, I say obviously a staff member, we've uh, seen cases where it's not a staff member but a customer of a particular site. Um, so you've got to consider all those sorts of things and can often involve um, review of CCTV footage to understand where the individual's been during their period. Um, but also, yeah, back to as, as I said, just the roles and, and the reason for them occupying that space. Um, from that, you're then able to uh, uh, put together a cleaning requirement and schedule addressing those areas, um, with the main focus being those high touched areas. So in a, um, a school scenario, which I'll talk on a, a case study a little bit later on, um, but you've got to consider that uh, pupils and students may actually be sitting on the floor and, um, and touching and, and coughing and sneezing around those areas. Uh, so that comes a consideration where in other spaces, it's not as um, as necessary to clean floors, uh, particularly carpeted floors. Um, so there is a different approach taken based on that site risk assessment and what you're able to determine uh, the use of the spaces. From there, uh, it goes into uh, implementing that cleaning sh schedule, which, uh, as I touched on before, the first step is going through and com uh, completely cleaning all of those frequently touched surfaces. Uh, followed through uh, with application of a disinfectant. Uh, sometimes that disinfectant is able to remain on the surfaces, but you do need to consider the types of surfaces and the reaction that the disinfectant may have if left uh, for a prolonged time. Um, that was something we encountered in a food manufacturing space. There was a particular requirement uh, with their manufacturing gear and the touchscreen panels that are used. 
so in a, in a space like that, we had to apply the disinfect and allow adequate dwell time for it to complete um, the appropriate disinfection and then it was removed uh, following with a final clean. Um, that also became um, something that was quickly worked on early last year with the Therapeutic Goods uh, Association of Australia, a government body that approved uh, appropriate chemicals or disinfectants as effective against COVID-19. Um, to begin with, uh, it was it was quite a short list. You'll find now it's quite extensive. You will have seen the Glen 20 ads uh, now that are approving that as a TGA certified and I think even Detol and some of those similar sort of household names are available and, and, and an option for use there. Dan, I'll uh, ask you to jump onto the next slide. Just talk about a couple of additional or optional steps when it comes to, to COVID cleaning and these these are two that are often uh, spoken about or seen in the media. So I touched before on, on fogging um, and that really going in and fogging a space, which is the application of a, of a chemical through a, a mist solution. It's not a um, it's not a simple solution for a COVID clean. Um, it, as I said, it will apply the disinfectant, but you'll be leaving behind soils uh, and, and grimes and, and uh, dirt that may still harbor the virus. Uh, so actually having a clean surface allows the disinfectant to uh, actively um, actively engage and fulfil its purpose. The other thing that um, certainly we saw was a big request to begin with was uh, clearance testing, and it's not a um, it's not a it's not a requirement, nor is it a, a simple thing to achieve or a, an exact science in the respect that there's no there's no formed uh, swabbing for surfaces where you're actually then able to send them off for, for sampling to come back and determine whether COVID nineteen is present. You've also got to consider that uh, if you were to do that in a large space, uh, the number of swabs you may need to take uh, would be quite significant to verify uh, the effectiveness. So what was adopted in the industry um, and, and is used quite frequently is a method of ATP swabbing. It's something that's been used for many years in food manufacturing. Uh, you may well have seen it in, uh, in mould remediation space as well. Um, what it is, it's it's basically a measure of cleanliness. So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, which is an organic compound that um, that provides energy in in um, in living cells and organisms. Um, and so, uh, like animals, plants, bacteria, yeasts, viruses, um, you're able to see uh, the level the level of uh, they call it relative light units. Um, which is effectively how active it is there. And the lower the count, the cleaner the surface. So you're really measuring how clean the surface is. So in order to uh, put forward, I guess, a, a clearance or a, a level of efficiency of the, the COVID clean, um, we take into account uh, the ATP swabbing and getting a, a low reading uh, on that, combined with also demonstrating that the appropriate steps have been taken uh, you've used a, an appropriate TGA certified uh, disinfectant and that's often what's put forward. Um, we've had to work with a number of times uh, speaking locally here in Victoria with our Victorian, our Victorian government and their COVID response team uh, demonstrating that those uh, cleaning schedules and plans have been put in place and providing copies of SDSs to verify that the uh, chemical or disinfectant used is uh, an appropriately approved product. Uh, Dan, I'll, I'll ask you to jump on to the next slide for me now if you don't mind. So this uh, slide that comes up here I found quite interesting. It's just an initial uh, snapshot of those first few months of the COVID-19 impact here in, in Australia. Um, covers off both the border and social distancing restrictions that came into play but some of the government uh, economical and financial uh, responses that was put forward as well. A couple of key points in there that uh, that aren't uh, clearly listed was uh, we had our first case here in Australia on the 25th of January. In fact, we had two. We had one in New South Wales and one in Victoria. Um, and a couple of months later, mid-March, we found our states uh, announcing public health orders or state emergencies uh, declared. Uh, following this, we started to see the 
uh, stage one and two restrictions come into place and each state was operating differently uh, but that's where we sort of really started to see the the impact that it had on the industry um, and the way that we had to change our approach uh, to certain uh, cat events that Dan will talk about a little bit later. Um, this is also where we started to see a number of uh, inquiries coming through from uh, businesses uh, sort of taking a proactive approach. Um, Dan, if you jump onto the next slide, um, what we saw really around sort of mid to late March was a significant number of inquiries coming into our business uh, for COVID-19 response plans. Um, mind you, most businesses at this stage or most uh, inquiries hadn't had any impact uh, of COVID-19. They hadn't had a, a, a staff member or customer into their premises that had been affected, but everybody was was preparing themselves, I guess, for the worst. Um, it was sort of the, the unknown for everybody and everybody trying to navigate their way through it, having the right uh, plan in place. So we had a number of calls from you know facility managers and the like, uh, wanting to put together, I guess, a bit of a response plan. Uh, we also found that people were asking for um, cost-based scenarios, which became quite challenging. One, that uh, we couldn't see the, the property. Two, we didn't know the impact. Um, had, it was hard to predict if they were to have a, a COVID uh, exposure at their site, what areas would they likely have been, um, been in and, and what would the appropriate cleaning schedule be? Um, we had a number of requests for cost-based scenarios on square metre rates, how, how much would it be per square metre to clean my site? And, and a lot of them had complexities with, well, what's the site's intended purpose? Is it an office space? Is it a warehousing facility? And I'll touch on a few warehousing facilities later in case studies where um, you might have a large space of 20 odd thousand square metres, but the vast majority of it is, is used for storage and racking and the um, individual interaction from staff or personnel is relatively minimal. So the approach can be um, tailored to that. Um, we also, through this time, and I think I touched on a bit earlier, but we had to identify suitable, me suitable uh, training methods. Um, obviously, it was, a, it was a new pandemic. We were in the early sort of stages of it. Um, since then, there's now been some training put together. Um, the Australian Department of Health have got a small training program that um, you can do online. Um, and there's a number of organisations that have put together COVID-19 response training. We, we were lucky enough to develop that internally um, early on, as I said, adopting a combination of trauma um, and clandestine uh, remediation methods. Dan, I'll get you to jump onto the, um, the next slide for me and they'll just jump into a couple of case studies before I hand over to Dan. Um, so this was one of our, one of our earliest um, examples. It was a school over in South Australia. We were um, receiving notification sort of late one afternoon and the request was to get the works commenced uh, the following morning and we had to be complete within 24 hours. Um, despite the school not planning to reopen, they had a window that they wanted to, to get this addressed. Um, and it was quite a large space, about 16,000 square metres of building area. On top of that, um, we also were requested to clean outdoor facilities, uh, school buses and, and other sort of uh, points of entry to the school. Um, a significant amount of, of carpet cleaning to be done there. As I touched on before, the, the use of schools, uh, there is more use of um, or, or exposure with the, the floor coverings in, in spaces like that. Um, one of the big challenges we saw there was particularly uh, early on uh, was the product and consumable supply. So at that point, um, many of you may remember if you were looking at similar options for um, your own offices, but there was a, a huge demand for surgical masks. Uh, not only that, then uh, similar organisations and cleaning contractors uh, were looking at um, uh, stocking Tyvex and uh, gloves, respirators, uh, and the cartridges that go along with them. So that was one thing that we found particularly difficult. Um, and also with this particular one, we had uh, we had challenges of uh, media coverage. It was quite a big thing at that particular time. It was one of the sort of first outbreaks, so we had to deal with with that. Um, and also 
the school itself actually had uh, public access continued to it. So it was sort of through a, a shared space or park area. Um, and while we were completing our claim, we still had the public walking through it and, uh, externally at particular times and that became challenging working around that. Dan, I'll get you to jump on to the, uh, the next example, the next case study for me. So this was a, a large uh, supermarket um, chain that had a uh, positive staff member. Um, we received a, a notification late one afternoon uh, and we're out there the same, the same evening. Um, this was an interesting one and as we were sort of getting further into understanding COVID-19 and how to respond, although it was a large area of uh, 20,000 square metres, the, the entire store, um, we only had to clean a small area where the staff member had been after we'd been through our risk assessment, identified the areas that that staff member had worked in the period that they'd been infectious. Um, so we resourced that. We had about eight staff that responded and uh, were done within that one evening. Um, the biggest challenge being that uh, the store actually remained open to the public. Thankfully, we were working behind closed doors, um, so it wasn't um, wasn't seen at the at the time. And we were able to um, work with the the store manager on, uh, I guess, appropriate access to, I guess, reduce any any alarm or concern at that point in time. And I'll uh, I'll jump onto my final case study, which was a. Um, a retail complex. Uh, so we actually were contacted by a number of stores within one retail complex. Um, they'd had a, uh, a customer that had been through the, the complex and entered a number of stores um, and we were requested by each to respond to uh, COVID deep cleaning for those sites. Um, the interesting thing here, the, the stores obviously ranged in size, some smaller than, than others. Um, but we also had to consider uh, the effects that the disinfectant or our products would have had on uh, different items. Being a, a retail complex, we had uh, some clothing stores in there, um, shoes and apparel, and some homeware stores. So we had to consider those sorts of um, elements and how we would address those appropriately. Um, this, as it uh, highlights at the top there, this was uh, not too long ago, a couple of months back now in July, um, which wasn't too long after the Victorian government announced a um, rebate program for businesses that were impacted by COVID-19. Uh, so we were also working with the, the store uh, managers there to how uh, we could present our costs so that they could uh, recoup some of those costs through that program. Um, and this one as well, uh, again, what we've seen as we got gotten later through the pandemic um, is a little bit more of a, 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 a planned approach to the response on these. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't an immediate request that we had to be there that evening. They wanted to work through um, in a more timely or a, a little bit more planned manner, which was which was good. Um, and obviously, they had their stalls shut down for that period. Now that brings me to the end of my case studies and um, I'll pass the, the conversation over to Dan. So James, and in a second, I'll get you to switch the presentation over to Dan. Um, Dan's just going to talk a little bit about the industry impact, the challenges we've faced and, and some of the um, some of the other things that we've encountered as a, I guess, a, a secondary item of COVID-19. Thank you. Dan, your mute's on, I think. There you go. We're working now? Yes. Good. Good to get it checked over before we start. So thanks for yeah, um, that good summary, Will, of the actual COVID cleaning techniques um, and some of the responses. As Will said, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the broader effects um, that some of not just the actual COVID itself, but the restrictions that have been in place upon us um, by governments um, and border shutdowns and how it's really affected us um, and the industry as a whole. So initially, once the international borders were shut, I mean, all industries were in a bit of an unknown space. We're all scrambling to understand what it means for us. It was a quick pivot to working from home um, uh, as an essential industry, our crews 
were still able to come into the office and go out to sites. Obviously, you can't respond to a flood or a fire from a desk, but our officers, workers um, had to pivot and work from home as pretty much everyone else did. There you go. Um, we, while we were still heading out and working on site, there was an increased um, PPE requirements and a lot of new COVID safe practices that we needed to implement, um, which really wasn't a challenge. It was all, all pretty um, doable. The real challenge that affected us and I think affected um, the industry as a whole and a lot of industries was when mid last year after the outbreak in Melbourne, um, when they started to go into domestic water restrictions. And this became um, a real challenge and obviously still an ongoing challenge for all of us. For some of the effects of having this domestic water restrictions here in Australia, um, as a, from a restorer, really curtailed our ability to send people from where they needed to be um, from one location to another. Um, traditionally in our industry to respond to large cat events, or a specific large claim, we will mobilise staff um, from one location to the other, um, just depending on the workload, and especially more relevant in those cat situations. Um, with the result of the border restrictions, some were completely hard and it was impossible to get people through. Um, some you were able to get people through and we had to make the choice when we were going to send staff and resources across, but they would have to quarantine when they came back. So there was an additional um, implication on that you might have your staff um, out for two weeks after doing a, a job and that had to be factored in um, both with the client and also as a business unit. Um, there was a lot of onerous permit systems to jump through, there still is. Um, we managed to overcome some of, of them via when we had to work on a particular central industry or infrastructure, um, but there was always additional requirements if people were sending through those those borders as in they would only be allowed to attend to the job and the rest of the time they would have to be in their hotel room under supervision. So we had a couple of events in Australia I'm talking about here during the time there was the Sydney storm um, pretty much straight, straight away uh, last year and then we also had the New South Wales widespread flooding earlier this year and while it was challenging with the resources um, we managed to, and I think most uh, restorers and, and insurers managed to respond to it with people in New South Wales, um, which is really the only way you can overcome some of these domestic water restrictions and respond to cattle art events is just by having a national presence or boots on the ground or partner offices that you can assist with. Um, which leads me into the, the next section that I like to talk about, which is the rise of remote assessments. Traditionally on, um, well, claims in the past and especially major claims now, it was very common for adjusters, insurers, consultants and restorers, builders, all to meet on site, do the assessment, walk through um, the plan with the, with the insured or the stakeholders and really come up with what we are doing right there on site, following by reporting later on. Um, with all of these border disruptions, um, with everyone locked in a home and Zooms, uh, the, the remote assessment or became a bit more commonplace. Um, and one of the things that we found very fortunate at just at about the same time COVID was really kicking off last year, we were also trialing some new technology. Um, when I say new technology, it's been around for a little while um, to Matterport 3D cameras. Uh, and there's other systems out there that do similar things. But we've had really good experience with this uh, technology. Um, and basically you stitch together a lot of 3D photos or scans from a site and it creates a fully walkable, um, navigatable 3D floor plan. And probably the best way for me to show you that is just to show you it. Um, so I might, this, I might need to duck out of this, reshare this different screen. So tell me when we can see a 3D scan. There you go. All right. Cool. So this is a scan of an office building um, or an office floor. This is what we call the dollhouse view, which is the 
top 3D floor plan. You can click on it anywhere from there. And then you get into this sort of 3D walkthrough of the site. From each of these points, which is where a camera scan would have taken, you've got a fully 360 or all dimensions view of the facility. You're able to take capture photos from here, so you don't need to take still photos. If you do this, you just go out and do the 3D scan of the entire site, and then you can take individual high res photos from this system. <clears throat> 